All right, let's get this thing started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Engineering Department Student Ambassador live stream. We're here today to help answer some of your questions. And yeah, hopefully it will be very interesting for all you guys watching at home. I'm Sam. I'm a first going on second year student at University College here in Oxford. And I'm joined today by Oscar. Uh, yeah, I'm Oscar. Um, I've just finished my third year at Oriel College doing engineering science, and I am going into my fourth year. Um, so yeah, Sam, maybe you can talk about what you've done so far. Yeah, so um, I've basically just got to the end of my first year. The first year of the Oxford Engineering course, you do a variety of subjects. So um, it's a general engineering course. I've been doing a bit of mechanical engineering, a bit of civil engineering, a bit of electrical engineering. Um, so all these kind of things you cover in your first and second years. Then when you get to the third year, and I'm sure Oscar can tell us more about this, you get to choose options and specialise into more of a specific discipline. Yeah, so to give a bit of background what I, I've done so far, um, as Sam said, in the first two years, you get involved in pretty much everything. And there's quite a lot. There's, um, there's four main modules. There's maths, energy, um, electronics, and what's the last one? Uh, uh, structures and mechanics. They kind of bundle that together. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> So in my third year, I chose to do a project which was based on using a multiple drone system. And we tried to use that in a park in South Africa to try and detect poachers, which is really interesting. Um, and I focused on kind of software engineering, control engineering. Um, and now into my fourth year, I'm going into stuff like robotics and control and machine learning. So I've kind of gone down that kind of path. Um, so yeah, should we get started on some questions? All right. So our first question is, why did you choose to study engineering? Oscar, do you want to kick off with your answer to that one? Um, that's a good question. I originally was into civil engineering, actually. Um, I'd always been interested in structures and stuff. Um, when I was little, I always read a lot about structures. I was just a very nerdy, nerdy kid. Um, but yeah, I, I suppose after that, I, I started started applying to civil engineering places and then I applied to one or two general courses as well because I wasn't fully set on the um, civil engineering pathway and Oxford is great for that because it has you know you can change and obviously I've changed my opinion halfway through and I'm not doing civil engineering anymore um, but yeah I suppose I got into it in the first place just because I used to watch a lot of stuff about civil engineering and I was kind of into that kind of thing. So for myself I I don't, um, probably the big thing that pushed me towards engineering was that I was a big fan of roller coasters and still to this day, it's my dream job to design roller coasters. So when I applied for universities, I applied for three general engineering courses because I th thought that mechanical engineering might be the discipline I'm most interested in. That's what I applied for the other two, but I really wasn't quite settled at that point. Um, still to this day, I'm still not entirely sure what I'm going to do for my third year options because it's still a matter of finding your feet and seeing what you enjoy most. But I think I've been quite surprised with how much I also enjoyed the programming things. That's something that I hadn't quite known what to expect going in, but I found that quite rewarding. I think another reason I went for engineering is because um, a lot of people find that they like maths and they like physics, but they don't particularly feel excited by a pure maths which is quite a theoretical degree or a pure physics degree so engineering is kind of the happy halfway house between those two things that allows you to do plenty of maths and plenty of physics without being uh, quite as intensely theoretical yeah I, I think it's important to touch on that um so you said that you're not sure in third year yet which is completely fine and um you get five choices out of 23 or 24, something like that, um, different choices. So there's quite a lot there and um, it, it doesn't really set what you're going to do. So yeah, I, I also wanted to do civil and then just went into like programming and technical subjects, which is really good. Um, but yeah, maybe we should answer this next question. Um, 
how practical is the course throughout compared to other universities? Um, so we were talking about this earlier, actually. I think that in general, Oxford courses are very theoretical um, just by the nature of what they, what they do. Um, so engineering science itself tells you that we, we study the science of engineering um, and it is very theoretical. So a lot of the projects we do, is, for example, in third year and fourth year, they're all very design based. So you'll design a system. Um, like I mentioned, I designed a drone system, um, which we never got to actually build because, you know, you don't really need to, to do that part in their view. But um, there are practical aspects of the course. So you do a lot of labs in your first two years and they involve lots of different parts of the degree, you know, stuff that you've learned about, you, they will try and get you to build something or use some apparatus that uses those design, um, or uses those theories. And then you have to talk about it with the demonstrators and that's how they mark you for those labs. Um, but yeah, for the, in terms of the third year and fourth year projects, there are a lot of um, design-based projects. And so next year, for example, I'm doing another drone-based project, which is um, researching kind of how resilient these multiple drone networks are to an, an adversary coming in to try and attack them. And it's all research-based. It's not, I'm, I don't have to build anything. Um, but I mean, I mean, you do have to code stuff, but yeah, a lot of it is quite theoretical. Sam, do you want to build on that? Yep, I've, um, obviously, I started Oxford at a strange time because I matriculated, started studying here in 2020, and pretty much all of my labs have been virtual. So I have a bit of a skewed opinion in terms of how practical the course is. However, I can say that in your first and second years, generally speaking, about one day a week um, for, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m., that is when you will have your labs. And that is the backbone of the practical element of the course. So you will have labs pretty regularly for more or less your entire first and second years at Oxford. Yeah, I fondly remember the... Um... I think in first year you get to build a little truss bridge and you get to make a radio and a few other things, which is actually quite good fun. Although I'm not sure if you actually managed to, to do that. Yeah, um, unfortunately, the, br the bridge did not get made, um, oh, sad. sadly. But, you know, hopefully as restrictions start to ease uh, in the next academic year, we'll get to do more of that kind of thing. So let's move on to the next question, which is asking, do you need any kind of ability or familiarity with coding before you start on the course? In my opinion, I don't think that it is an absolute necessity. Honestly, if you do have time, say if you did get an offer and you were thinking of what to do to prepare over the summer once you finish your A-levels, looking at some coding is very much a good idea in that kind of time frame. Um, but equally, it's not a prerequisite. Computer science is not something that you are expected to have knowledge of. And when we do start the computing labs in uh, your first year, we it's more or less assumed that no one implicitly has any knowledge of the coding. So you can start from scratch. And even if you might find it a bit harder, you will still have a completely fine experience. Um, yeah, I would agree with that. I think there's absolutely no need to have a coding before you start. I had none. Um, I was interested in civil, as I said, and had no intention of going into something coding based. And then after, I mean, when I did it, there wasn't any Python. It was all MATLAB. I think they've added Python since. Um, um, but they don't, yeah, they, they always assume that you don't have any knowledge and they take you through from the start. And um, so I did a software engineering module in third year as well. And they use C++ for that. Um, but they, again, they teach you that expecting that no one actually has previous knowledge. Um, if you come in with knowledge, it probably does help. Um, but, you know, you don't have to. Um, and I actually started learning in second and third year outside of the degree, a bit of coding knowledge myself. And that really helped me go towards what I want to do after university. So that was just something that I did during the degree. And I had no knowledge before the degree itself. So, yeah. Um, okay, should we do the next one? Um, mm -hmm. What kind of extracurricular engineering projects or societies are there at Oxford? Um, so we can start off by answering, I used to be heavily involved in the engineering society and I had a lot of fun with that. So 
I, I was on committee for a while and essentially they put a few events together with industry people, you know, industry partners will come into the society and say, we want to give you some money if you put on an event. Um, and so we will try and display lots of different industries to the student population. And that kind of increases the exposure. It's quite good fun. And, you know, you can go along and say hello to them. Um, we also did a few social events throughout the year and, you know, a few kind of one-off things, um, which would be more like we, we tried to do a team for the Red Bull Soapbox racing, which is quite fun. Um, and then I also got slightly involved in the Oxford Robotics Institute do RoboCup, which is um, it's quite intense, but it's if you're an undergraduate, you can come in with no knowledge and they kind of help you get involved in one aspect of the team, which is really interesting. And they go out to different places all over the world and do this competition. Um, that was good fun. Equally, I'd say that as well as the extracurricular engineering uh, projects and societies, as an engineering student, you can absolutely still get involved in stuff that isn't strictly engineering. So, for example, I am the JCR president at UNIF at the moment. Uh, every year or so, one or two of us engineers decide we're crazy enough to take on that responsibility. So there's plenty of things outside of engineering, like student politics. Um, and yeah, basically not just engineering and you can really get involved in the breadth of stuff here. Yeah, I would also say that uh, most people who do engineering or any other subject really get involved with other things at university. So it's not, it's not the case that you don't have time to do that. You know, I get pretty involved with rowing and obviously lots of people do other sports and other extracurricular activities. So there's all sorts of things going on. Um, you get involved with, um, but yeah, there are, there are all those opportunities available. So our next question is asking about what kind of personal traits beside academic potential are preferred for an engineering student? That's, that's an interesting question, actually. I've, I've never been asked that one before. I would probably say, I think as an engineering student, one thing that's helped me is probably resilience because as an engineering student, it's a, there's a lot of application-based stuff inherently um, compared to, for example, in maths, you might be learning a set number of proofs and it's a lot of recall. If you have fantastic recall, then you are going to succeed uh, easier in the exams. Whereas for engineering students, it's a lot more about applying the knowledge to specific unfamiliar scenarios so resilience in dealing with those scenarios and kind of deconstructing them i would say would be one thing that i would mention oscar do you have any anything you would reckon for that it's a hard one to answer it feels like an interview um <laughs> I, I think that maybe being inquisitive you know you a lot of the learning is is different from when you leave a levels in school and that you get a set a very very clear syllabus where everything is laid out and you get like a textbook which follows along with the course very quickly um it's not quite like that in a university for most subjects and engineering in particular you know you might get given a few books that are useful for you and you get pointed towards the right resources um and they are very good with lecture notes etc but they don't follow along with exactly what's going on you have to do a bit of research for yourself you have to lead your own learning I guess it sounds a bit cliche but it is true you you do need to do your own stuff so um I think being prepared to just when you're you, when you're doing your two sheets and going into labs even um being able to you know I, I use YouTube so much like it was <laughs> so useful um just finding stuff all over the web is just really good um you have to be good at yeah leading your own learning I suppose but that is a skill that you learn as you go through I would also um, throw into the mix um and I don't know if Oscar might have completely different opinions on this, but collaboration. Um, I know that at my college, they strongly encourage engineers to work together on, for example, problem sheets. Um, A, in part, because it's so much more efficient, two heads are better than one. Um, and even if you don't have that in an exam, I would strongly recommend that just a bit of teamwork and things like that can make your life on the engineering course uh, quite a bit quite a bit easier yeah that's true i think it's good to to hit up your you know fellow engineers and be 
and ask them for questions and stuff. And especially when you go into third year, you you have a team project. So you do have to work with you know, a team of four or five people and you get a mark based on that team. Um, in fourth year, your project is on your own. But yeah, I, I would agree. But yeah, all these skills, I think you can definitely, you can definitely learn and just uh, improve as you go along. All right. So our next question is what college would you recommend for engineering science? Now, I know that me and Oscar probably both feel that our college is the best college and, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have it any other way. But um, one important thing that I think engineers should consider when they're uh, picking a college, uh, A, first off, check the college you want to apply to offers engineering. I know that's a silly thing, but like, um, for example, UNIV, which is my college, offer it, but Queen's College, just across the road, to the best of my knowledge, do not offer it. So don't get tripped up by that. Number two is cohort size. So cohorts, um, in terms of the average yearly intake, obviously it varies quite a bit from year to year. However, I think it's a useful thing to consider generally. So at UNIV, we tend to average six to eight engineers in our annual intake um that's pretty much on average uh, yeah that's pretty much average if not on the bigger end of colleges oscar am i right in thinking oriel is about four to six uh we always have six six there we go yeah. um so but i know that one or two colleges do have less so i think christchurch might be more like four keyboard this year had something like 14 so do consider that um in terms of proximity to the department, that is one reason why Keeble is always a very popular choice because it's right next door and engineering students <laughs> will quite happily roll out of bed 10 minutes before a lecture and still be there on time. Uh, Keeble, Somerville, St. John's, they're all very near, but ultimately, basically, every college is within 15 minutes walk of the engineering department. It's pretty well located in that sense. Um, mm. Yeah, Oscar, do you have anything extra to add on to that? I mean, I would agree. I think in terms of what people often ask this on a on a open day and they'll say, you know, oh, what's the best college for engineering? And you'd be like, well, you know, there isn't such thing really because uh, most of the teaching is done departmentally. And yeah. so you can't really look at the tutors and say, well, I really want to use these guys um, in your first two years because you don't know which tutors you're going to use. And even in later years where you do more specific subjects, they will send you to the tutors and DPhil students that are more specific to what you're learning anyway. So you won't be learning in your college after that point. Um, but yeah, it is important. So you mentioned location, size of the college, you know, who do they do engineering? That's all important. I think it's, you know, for example, I chose Oriel because I went to the open day and they let me stay over and I just really liked it. And I met the tutor, which is quite lucky. You don't normally get to do that, I think. But, as you know, if you can just imagine yourself living there and, and having a good time, you know, maybe look at what extracurriculars that the colleges do. Um, I think it's important to remember that Oxford is a small place. So don't just choose a college because you can't be bothered to walk. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a good reason sometimes. But if you get a bike, it's very easy, honestly. Um, and yeah, I think there's, there's lots of colleges. So just have a look. Yeah. Um, if obviously I know at the minute it's still a bit restricted, some colleges are allowing in-person visitors, some colleges are not. Um, if you do get a chance to go to Oxford, that is always really good and probably the best way to get an honest assessment of does this college just feel right? Um, I, and before you do that, if you do get the chance, although appreciate it's an unusual year, um, try to narrow down to maybe like four or five, not only so you don't have to trek around 15 odd colleges, but I think when you're looking at more than five, the choice gets a bit paralyzing. Yeah, I, I think it's also worth noting that when you, um, I think I, I have some friends that go to colleges where there's only, you know, two or three of them on the same subject. Mm -hmm. And even in that case, um, you will meet people from other colleges. So it's fine, you know, you will see people of your same subject. And you also make friends with people in your college um, more so than anything else so you meet a wider range of people in all sorts of subjects um, so I wouldn't worry that too much um, but yeah that was a good point um, should we move on to the next question which mm -hmm. is how much independent research and learning is typically required on the course 
Um, so I just touched on that briefly. Um, I think there's there is a fair bit, and I think it surprised me a little bit that you you know when you move from A level, it's quite different. Um, engineering in particular, compared to other subjects, is quite good in the sense that we normally get a very good set of lecture notes that follow the lectures very closely and they expand on what was said. And you can usually answer, so basically you have two tutorial sheets every week and you can usually answer them um, using just the lecture notes and maybe a little bit of extra material. Um, I found it at least anyway. So in, in terms of independent research, you don't always have to, but um, I think it's, it's a useful skill to be able to research things up online. You know, I, I didn't really use books that much when I did them but I was able to find most things online. And um, yeah, I think it's not too bad engineering compared to other sciences. Yeah, I would very much second the point that as an engineer, I found that um, Google more so than libraries has probably been my closest friend. Um, obviously there are some very useful textbooks and college libraries and general Oxford University libraries are incredibly well stocked. Um, for the most part. So, for example, at my college, if there's a particular book that the tutors know that we will need in a year, they always try and make sure that we have at least like six plus copies so that nearly every engineer, if they so desire, can have this textbook out at once. Um, but in terms of problem sheets, in terms of actual hours spent on them, it varies very much from like, you know, just how confident you feel with that particular subject, how long the problem sheet is at the start of the year and first year, you get some that are like absolute dreams and you can get through them in like uh, seven hours or something. But then later on in the year, you might have one or two that are quite long, quite tough. For me, um, there's a topic called vector calculus, which you do not need to know anything about. But the first vector calculus sheet in first year was not the most fun time because it was quite long and quite a tough one. And that probably took me more like 15 to 20. Yeah. The average comes in probably 10 to 15 per sheet. Um, so generally quite a bit of independent learning, but Oscar said, yeah, summed up very well. The resources are there. It's just self-motivated. Um, yeah, I would say that, especially um, as you go into third year as well, you obviously have a research project. So that is entirely your own research. Um, but that's after you've done two years. So you get pretty good at it by that point. Um, All right. So next question is regarding personal statements. Very much a hot topic for the minute. I know quite a few people will be on um, fairly high level drafts by this point. So what kind of things do you include? Should it focus on academics or supercurricular activities? So I guess my first question with this is just where is the distinction between academics and supercurricular activities? Because in, in my opinion, I think if supercurricular activities to me is anything that relates to the subject that is just outside of the standard curriculum. For me, my uh, personal statement lent very heavily on this, but in that definition, I'm including things like uh, Olympiads and um, work experience and all that, all that kind of stuff. I think talking about your, uh, I guess, standard academics, so what is in the syllabus, is possibly, just from my own perspective, if I read that in a personal statement, I don't think it's quite as uh, exciting in the sense that you know it's an experience that you've had obviously through school and whilst is very valid academically um a tutor might think okay sure but how has this shown that you've pursued your subject outside of school um so supercurricular activities uh, work experience any research you've done doesn't just have to be books as a common misconception it can absolutely be online articles just going into a Google rabbit hole and then finding something that's really quite interesting to you. Um, Olympiads, um, things like that. Oscar, do you have anything more that you would add to that list? Yeah, I think it's quite hard to say whether you should do academics or supercurriculars more. I think as long as you have stuff that you can talk about quite easily, something that you know obviously shows your interest in engineering is really useful. And one, I think one of the best tips I got was that when I applied, 
um, people were asking all sorts of questions on the open day saying, oh, should I do this for my statement? Should I do this? And they, they were kind of saying, you know, you don't have to do any of them, really. You just have to do something that you're interested in and show your interest quite well. So as you mentioned, it could literally be anything. I mean, I know some people that have done like coding projects and some people have messed with Raspberry Pis. And, you know, even if you do something practical based, like I think I, I did something with Play-Doh where I built a little arch and uh, described it using math. Um, that was a bit of a weird one, but it it was quite good fun. And I think they appreciate learning about it. Um, so yeah, it could be anything that shows your interest, though, really. Nice. So um, next question is asking about how many students would change their mind from their initial engineering field choice? Oscar, I think you're best equipped to, uh, to answer this one. Yeah. I imagine that it's quite a few change their minds. I think a lot of people do. I think it's uh, when you go into a general engineering course and you have an idea of what you want to do and just before you start, it's really hard to say whether you really do want to do that because you haven't learned about it yet and you don't know what it is. And that was the case with me in civil engineering. So I just decided that even though it was really interesting to me beforehand, learning about all the maths and physics and um, learning, of, seeing more of the third year modules where you have to choose to do civil engineering I decided that they weren't really for me um, and you know it's it's quite a you spend a while making these choices and you you have up until you do your exams to actually make that decision in third year um, so yeah a lot of people chop and change even even in third year they'll change their choices for modules and probably the same in fourth year as well so yeah I chose to do something more technology based and I think that was more just because I did a lot of coding in my second year and um i think i think you'd be surprised i, I would give a good estimate of at least like 50 percent of people change their mind oh and uh, second part of the question it was are some fields more overloaded than others um some some have quite a lot i mean i think in my cohort we all do electronics and information engineering based modules i think that's quite rare though that we all do the same thing um, if you look at the actual choices, they are fairly well spread out. Um, and uh, Oxford itself actually does have a lot of, if you look at the choices for projects, there's a lot of machine learning and information engineering projects, um, but they kind of fit those into different categories of engineering. So you might do like a biomedical project where you're using machine learning to look at arteries or like, you know, using machine learning to optimize the efficiency of engines or something. And I think that's just because Oxford is quite good at that. Um, but there are a very good range of, of different ones available. Yeah, from my perspective of the second year, the only option I'd heard about being like especially uh, popular, I don't know if it necessarily was oversubscribed, but very popular was probably uh, machine learning stuff because it's it's very much the uh, one of the flavours of the day when it comes to engineering. It's a field where there's a lot of interesting research and interesting development happening. Mm, there's, a, there's a lot of... Um... I think the department itself does a lot of research and even if you're not interested in that you might well be pushed towards it um, <laughs> at some point um so, yeah, so the final question our last question is what tips would we have for anyone considering an application to study engineering at oxford um i would say preparation is a, a big thing i think quite often um some schools say that like oh the Oxford interview process is mystical and no one really knows how it works. But I I don't think that's true. I think that it's absolutely something that with enough hard work, you can improve that. So particularly the actual interview itself, you can practice for by talking through problems. There's a book that I would highly recommend, Professor Povey's Perplexing Problems. Um, it's got a bunch of kind of interview style questions and practicing with those and speaking them through to either a friend, a teacher, anyone else willing to listen is incredibly useful. So that becomes something that feels natural in an interview, explaining your thought processes. Um, and just with like a bit of preparation on that, you will find that is quite a significant improvement on how comfortable you feel in the interview. Oscar, do you have any particular final suggestion? 
Um, that was, I mean, the application process was still a while ago for me, so I think you are better equipped to answer that. But yeah, I, I agree. They're all good points. I think as long as you, as long as you um, practice the physics and math questions, um, you're pretty well set. And I think in terms of the, a lot, yeah, a lot of people ask about personal statements when they're applying. And I think finding, having, having a look around and finding a little project that you can get stuck into and then talk about on your statement is actually a really good thing to do. I'd say that's a, it's a good idea. Absolutely. Okay, in that case, I think we're going to wrap up the live stream here. Just a heads up for those watching, we do have another live stream Q&A coming up at 2 p.m. with one of our admissions tutors, uh, which is Professor Antoine Jerusalem. And we're also collectively, not just specifically me and Oscar, online taking questions over Slido until 4 p.m. So thank you all very much watching uh, for attending. And I hope we've answered some questions. Thank you.